Are you interested in a graduate degree in the social sciences? Are you applying to or from the UK and want someone with deep insight into the differences between those educational systems? Well, our guest today is going to discuss these topics and many more. You're invited to listen in. Welcome to Admission Straight Talk, the podcast dedicated to graduate admissions and helping you approach the application process thoughtfully and successfully. Your host is Acceptance founder and world-renowned admissions guru, Linda Abraham. At Accepted, our mission is to get you to that unforgettable moment when you read your acceptance email and shout, yes, I'm in, confident you'll be attending the perfect program to help you launch the career of your dreams. Welcome to the 574th episode of Admission Straight Talk. Thanks for joining me. The challenge at the heart of admissions is showing that you both fit in at your target schools and stand out in the applicant pool. Except it's free download, fitting in and standing out, the paradox at the heart of admissions will show you how to do both. Master this paradox and you're well on your way to acceptance. You can download this free guide at accepted.com slash F-I-S-O. Again, this accepted.com slash F-I-S-O. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Sundas Ali to Admission Straight Talk, originally from Pakistan. Sundas received both a BS in economics and econometrics and a master's in international relations from the University of Bristol in the UK, and then a PhD in sociology from the University of Oxford. She worked for several years at the UK civil service and since 2013, until basically a few, few months ago, has served as a lecturer at the University of Oxford. While at Oxford, she was involved in Oxford's prestigious PPE, which is philosophy, politics, and economics, admissions process. She has also been involved in teaching high school and college students in rural areas of Pakistan through online platforms, as well as guiding them through the college admissions process. At Accepted, Sundas will be working primarily with college and graduate school applicants. The show today will focus on graduate school admissions as always. Sundas, welcome to Admissions Rate Talk and Accepted. Thank you, Linda. It's a pleasure to be on this podcast today, and uh, I'm absolutely delighted to be a part of the team at Accepted. And I'm delighted to have you both as a part of the team and on the podcast. So we're both happy campers. Okay, at Oxford, you work with both with students both at Oxford and outside of it who wanted to attend UK graduate programs. Mm -hmm. Is there some quality or element of the admissions process that is unique to universities, to UK universities rather, or to Oxford, something that non-UK applicants need to adjust to? Yes. Um, so having worked with students for over 15 years, I think, uh, you know, at Oxford and those outside of wanting to apply to the UK, US and, uh, and the rest of the world, I think what's perhaps distinct about the UK, uh, I would say it's, it's quite similar to other countries when it comes to graduate applications. Um, if we were looking at college, that's quite a difference between the US and the UK. But I find that actually for graduate programs, there's quite a lot of similarity. You know, for example, there's the, the personal statement, the academic statement of uh, personal statement, which is which is very important uh, when applying for graduate study in the UK. And it's similarly very important when you're applying to the yeah. US. So there, there are broad, I think, a lot of similarities across the board when it comes to graduate study. The degree programs vary. Um, so we have, you know, different degree structures in the UK. So you have uh, an MRes, for example, which, which is a research degree and different types of degrees to the US, perhaps, which are uh, maybe, uh, you know, there are two different types of graduate programs when it comes to master's. But um, specifically thinking about Oxford and Cambridge, um, I would say what's quite different is that when you're applying to Oxford and Cambridge, you are applying to not just a department, but also a college. So that's quite a big difference, which I think the US, my US students who are applying to Oxbridge had to get used to, like, what is this? We're applying to a department, but also a college. What does that mean? What's the distinction? Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so if, for example, if you're applying for um, a master's in social policy, so you'd be applying to the social policy department, that's where your application for that MSc would go. But then you would also be selecting a college um, on your application. And that's, and you, you can choose a college out of uh, the, the colleges that, that are uh, available, or they, you will be randomly allocated a college. And the college essentially is your home. That's where, uh, you know, it's, it's, that's where you, uh, that's where your lodging is. That's where you live. You will also have tutors and fellows there. So it's a very academic environment and you will be attending seminars and, and some graduate colleges in Oxford. Uh, I was at Nuffield myself and, you know, we had, 
about three, four seminars every week, one on politics, uh, sociology, media, economics. So the, the environment is very academic, but your main academic learning, like your lectures, that happens in the department. So that's where you would be going for your uh, for your lectures and your classes, but you'd be living in the college. But both are trained to develop you um, and to, uh, you know, to, to benefit you academically. So it's a dual system in Oxbridge. So, so I think that's probably what U- US students would have to, would find new when applying to Oxford or Cambridge. But with other universities, I think uh, it's it's a very academic um, environment and I and we can talk a bit more about that. If I, if I get it correctly, the colleges have a, a social slash communal aspect to them in addition to perhaps a certain academic focus, whereas mm-hmm. the departments are strictly, like you say, your classes, yes, your lectures, yes. et cetera, the, yes. school, the school part of it. Yes, exactly. That yes, but you know, but it, it it also means it's it's perhaps a little bit more expensive if you're applying to Oxford or Cambridge because you have a college fee and you also have a department fee. So there, this is another sort of a surprise when you apply to Oxford <laughs> or Cambridge. Oh, there's the more money involved, but you you may you may be eligible for scholarships or bursaries. Um, so it's 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 understanding because some students ask what's the purpose of having two, but actually the the system works really well. You get a lot out of your college, and you know the interaction that you have for example when you're having lunch or dinner or going to high table you're you're meeting fellows you're meeting alumni you're meeting and then they have the there's um you can go to different colleges for dinner so there's a lot of um, learning that happens quite informally over the table when you're discussing research papers and ideas um so 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 i think that's uh, and i found that very fruitful like when i was doing my default there wonderful Wonderful. Now, conversely, in applying, mm-hmm. if you're applying to U.S. graduate programs mm-hmm. from the U.K. specifically, is there something that internationals need to have yeah. explained to them, mm-hmm. or is it pretty pretty much the same? Or what what would be different? Well, so I think so. Let's look at it culturally first. I think I think overall, what I found um, when when a, looking at different universities, you know, in the U.K. and the U.S. I think the UK overall has quite, like I was saying earlier, an academic approach, quite a formal approach, and and there's more emphasis. For example, if you're uh, applying for a, you know a graduate program or a PhD, and it, it, the modules that you studied, what were your marks in those? Um, so it's it's more academic the the requirements. But when you're applying to the US, um, and I play, I explain this to my UK students, you are uh, there, there's you know there's also the extracurricular activities, but the work experience, which is also quite important for US. Uh, colleges, whereas I think in the UK that's not in the same, uh, you know, in in the same uh, in the same way. Uh, but I think if you're applying to the top US universities, you would be uh, required to, you know, prove some work experience also. So I think it's uh you know as well as your statement of purpose your work experience matters a lot but also then the standardized testing so the gre the gmat that's something for uk students to, to takes them some time to uh, to understand so where do they stand and if they have a 2 1 what does that translate into a gpa is that 3.5 yeah. or 3.7 etc so getting getting used to the idea of a of a, of a gpa uh you know and and what, what how they stand in in that um um so measuring themselves in the in those metrics but also accumulating that work experience yeah and then of course the other the other things are, i think quite similar the recommendations that uh, both both countries require good recommendations and uh, you know uh, transcripts etc but it's it's the difference between i think i think there's more work experience which the us universities look for in their applications and the work experience, I assume that would vary depending upon the degree program. You mean MBAs, yes. yeah. they want full-time, you know, at least mm-hmm. minimum, minimum two mm-hmm. years, preferably more. I don't think for law, for JD, it's it's a requirement. It's just something that happens, seems to be happening at the average age of mm-hmm. entering mm-hmm. law school applicants has gone up. Medical schools mm-hmm. definitely want applicants to have had clinical exposure, but in the academic arena and social policy, for example, sociology, political science, uh, masters of public policy are internships adequate you know summer internships mm-hmm. that that re- are relevant or mm-hmm. it is again is it full-time work experience that, that's that's important I think yeah I think internships are adequate it's it's just demonstrating on your CV on your resume why you want to apply for that graduate program 
uh, what's the motivation, what, what is your incentive? Um, and, and I think that helps your application. So it's not a requirement, but I think it's just the culture of US universities that they do uh, like to see more than just your academic marks. Yeah. Um, so the internships, have you done something relevant, you know, in, in uh, two or three years while you were at doing your undergraduate? Um, have you perhaps worked with a, a professor um, at your university while you were doing your undergrad? Have you maybe co-authored a paper or thought about sure. the process of research? So demonstrating some sort of that extra more than just your, uh, you know, marks that you've received. So internships, yes, absolutely. I think uh, it's just yeah, proving why what your motivation is because you know it's. It, I feel like I think you know. So when you're applying for a graduate program, you you have to prove why you want to take that one step further into higher education. Uh, it, it it shouldn't be just uh, that I, I don't know what else to do or you know I don't want to work in the real world yet and a lot yeah. of students say this they say that i just don't want to go into the real world yet and, and i i don't i don't it's too scary or three years just ended <laughs> before i knew it and <laughs> and i just want to keep on studying more but i think you know what universities want to see and that's the uk us europe everywhere what they want to see is why that extra year or two years now um so you do have to show uh, you know that <laughs> that motivation and that should come across and the more practical experience you have to prove that the better Right, right. It's pretty hard to write a statement of purpose if you don't have a purpose. That's just, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's just kind of the bottom line. Mm -hmm. Now, let's say you have that purpose. You have a good reason for wanting to pursue graduate study. Mm -hmm. Let's assume it's an academic, you know, master's or an academic or, or the PhD. How do you recommend that mm -hmm. applicants decide where to apply? Mm -hmm. Um, so I find that a lot of the applicants who I have worked with, um, they actually already have a good idea of their, you know, four or five schools that they that they that they have in mind, and they they've already thought about it. But sometimes it's a subject, so they're very sure that this is the subject I want to do. For example, I want to do anthropology, or I want to do sociology, or I want to do economics, and it, and I always tell them to to start thinking about it in you know quite in advance. So um, uh, and to think. To think of the first of all, yes, the schools. If you're not sure, let's then, if you're sure about your subject, let's let's research and let's have a look at uh, four or five universities and their ranking. What is their research culture like? Speak to current students in that university. So as much research you can do beforehand. So investigative research to make your decision firm, and because that will then come across in your statement of purpose or your personal statement. So I always say, think about the subject and think about your, uh, you know, four or five universities that you have. Um, and I, I can work with them on that usually, but I think these days, uh, you know, with, with the students are very uh, digitally, digitally capable. And I think students do that research and the more, it is a full-time job applying for a master's or a PhD and a Amazing, PhD sure. and a PhD becomes even more um, specialized. So you really have to think about your research question and spend some time developing your research proposal. I mean, I remember when I was uh, apl applying for my PhD, I spent about a week. I, I took a book out from a library on research methods and I, and I sat down and thought about what are the four or five interesting topics that I would like to research on for, for four or five years, you know, it, and it, it's not an easy thing or it, because it has to be a topic that you're very passionate about. And then I looked at research methods and I studied that and I, and I, wrote, I wrote a research proposal, a draft one, and then I emailed it um, to a few uh, academics in different universities. And then I got a response from a couple of them and I went to meet them. And so I did, a, you know, I, I did all of that. Work. A lot of work. <laughs> So, so it, yeah, so I think a PhD is even more specialized and, and that requires you to really think hard, but we can, yeah, I know we'll talk about that a bit more. In a, so I think that's, that's my approach when thinking where to apply. Okay, great. And obviously being competitive is part of that process, mm -hmm. isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. assume if you're applying in a different country, it's a little bit harder, but let's say you're in the United States mm -hmm. and, you know, some programs, the information is published. It's on the website, the class profile, whatever you can, you can assess at least if your stats are competitive, your, your GPA, your GRE, mm -hmm. but assuming it's required, but what if it's not published for your department or your, your area of study? Do you have any recommendations in that case in mm -hmm. terms of assessing competitiveness? Uh, yeah, I think there's, uh, you know, there's many different ways that you can uh, look at 
the competitiveness of that university. Uh, you can look at uh, you can look at their research ranking, their research, you know, their research culture, and how many. Uh, you can you can also email them and you can ask them. Um, so I think you know it's uh, yeah. I, I don't think we should go into this blindly. So there there is uh, if you look at the admissions requirements. If you don't find what you're looking for, you could email them and, and sure. get the answers to that. So I think, yeah, I think it's it, it just finding out beforehand when the deadlines are, uh, when should you be thinking about writing your uh, SOP or your personal statement, planning ahead, who will you ask for recommendations? And if you don't, perhaps sometimes students don't meet the requirements. They don't have the GPA um, or, 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 the, or the required, but they really want to, to go to that university and do that course. And and then we also think through quite creatively, could we actually make it happen somehow? Were there extenuating in circumstances, which you know maybe didn't lead the student to achieve the result that they wanted to? So I think, yeah, it's it's not it's not that black and white in my experience, I think. And especially in the US, I think in the US universities, the, 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 perhaps there is a little bit more that could be said about the informal relationships you do have, you know, uh, amongst your networks and how that plays a role as well. True, true. Um, and, you know, when I I don't have a PhD, but when I've talked to people who do have PhDs, including, you know, guests on the show, they've all emphasized mm -hmm. the importance of the relationship with your advisor. Mm -hmm. you, know, you have to be comfortable with that person. Now, you mm -hmm. have a wealth of experience in admissions at Oxford specifically. What do you think is critical for graduate applicants, let's say, applying to the PPE program that you were a part of? Mm -hmm. um, or applying to master's degrees or PhD degrees in the social sciences? Mm -hmm. So um, particularly for Oxford, so PPE is an undergraduate program, so that right, would be so that would, yeah. okay. Yes, but, but um, you know, of course, and there's an interview required for that. But I think for the for the graduate programs, usually there isn't an interview required, but it's um, Oxford, Oxford follows, uh, I, mean, I mean, the minimum requirements are that you have um, at least a 2-1 uh, in your, which would be equal to about a 3.5 GPA in an undergraduate, and also expected to receive a fairly, re you know, good mark in your, uh, if you're applying for a PhD, for example, a good mark in your master's thesis. Um, uh, so I think uh, that that's, and, and then three recommendations are required. So that's quite different to other universities. Some, most universities I know require two, but Oxford requires three. Um, and they should be from your uh, professors. Uh, that would be ideal that you, you know, if you, for example, if you're applying for a PhD, uh, so then in your master's, uh, who was the three most uh, academics that you worked with in your, for your master's, that would be mostly your research supervisor and perhaps two other people that you worked with in that um, uh, in that duration of your master's. So I think it's uh, the, the recommendations play a really big uh, part because they will show how much uh, research, uh, you know, how, how capable or how savvy you are with research, with research methods, and, and those uh, recommendations uh, play quite a critical role, but also in your uh, academic statement uh, of purpose here again. So then this, for a PhD, you really need to uh, show that you have thought through your research proposal, what methods you're going to use. So for example, it's um, it wouldn't be enough to say, I just want to study anthropology, but you know, what is it particularly in anthropology? What are the particular elements? that spark your academic, you know, your curiosity. So, uh, for example, uh, what is it about uh, different religions and beliefs that interests you? Um, what causes ethnic conflict in the world? So being very specific about that. So in sociology, I had to, you know, write out four or five different research questions. And then uh, why do they interest me? What does the current literature say? Um, what are the methods that I'd be following? Um, and then I went to discuss it with, you know, potential supervisors. Um, so Oxford, I would say, is quite robust in its methods, and they, they they want to see that you've thought through the research methods, you have an understanding of research methods if you're applying for a master's or a PhD. Um, so it would really help undergraduate students to be thinking like that if they're thinking of further study, to thinking like in, in their in their final year, in their senior year. Right. I read a book a few years ago, I've mentioned this on the show before, mm -hmm. um, written by Bernard Lewis, mm -hmm. the Middle Eastern historian, I'm sure you've- Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And so his memoirs, he talks at one point in the book about interviewing a certain student. He never said which disputed land was involved, but the students wanted to research why this piece of disputed land belonged to country X, not country Y. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. Lewis asked him, he says, what if it turns out your research shows that it belongs to country Y, mm -hmm, not country mm -hmm. X? 
Mm -hmm. And he said, well, it won't show that. Mm -hmm. He says, well, how do you know? Mm -hmm. He said, because everybody knows it belongs to country X. Mm -hmm. Lewis right. did not take him into his PhD program. <laughs> okay. He right. was not yeah. interested in, in somebody who was not willing to follow mm -hmm. the research, the science. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. yes, you, you have this example, it proves that you should be open to finding an answer, which you're not actually expecting. Uh, yeah. It's a, challenging your, your own thoughts and, and, and being really open-minded about, uh, yes, just the answer. And with a PhD, the way to summarize it, in, in my understanding, is you're creating something original, and 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 that's that's the whole process. But you know, it's it's a get, great exercise to if you. I think if you can create that, then it helps you a lot in professional life later. Um, you know, the, the kind of steps involved in creating that original piece of knowledge. You no, know, that's a great example you've given. <laughs> It was a, it was a nice passage in the book. It was an interesting book too. How do you advise applicants to approach their graduate school statement of purpose or mm -hmm. the graduate application as a whole, but the statement of purpose in particular? Mm -hmm. So when I get asked this question, the way I think there's, there's one way to think about it, which, uh, you know, imagine that a professor is reading 500 applications is locked in a room and reading 500 applications, right. uh, 500 personal statements. What will make him or her um, re want to read your personal statement or your statement of purpose more than just the first paragraph. So, you know, and, and, and a very typical uh, uh, introduction to um, a personal statement says, I would like to study this course, I'm applying for this, and this will enhance my skills and, you know, and, and, and develop me professionally. You know, that's something very obvious. That's something Actually, it, and it's it's quite uh, it's taking up maybe you know a, few, a lot of the, the word count that you have in three or four lines. You could be. I, I always say to my students, look for really question yourself first of all. Why do you want to apply for that course? And 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 write that. Write something which 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 captures uh, you know the curiosity of that professor reading it, and then he thinks, oh, I really yes, I do want to carry on reading. What's there has to be a hook. Um, what's that hook? And you really have to dig for that hook sometimes. You have to dig through your own mind to find your hook for your personal statement that will that will keep the attention of, of that uh, you know, professor reading your personal statement. So really think hard and, and write something captivating. Uh, that should be, but you know, having said that, the UK and the US, there's a difference as well. In the UK, they don't want you to write something too dramatic. So <laughs> it's I find that there's also a cultural difference. But it has to be something different and something original that starts your personal statement. And then it shouldn't be too long. Um, I find that this is a very a common, uh, you know, uh, mistake that applicants make. They they write, you know, two pages or some sometimes long. It should really be even less than the full page. It should it should be very concise and very focused um, and not generic. But if for applying for a graduate program, you have to show some advanced thinking. And, and again, you know, when we're, when students are applying for undergraduate, they have a lot of help. They have a lot of support from their counselors, from their teachers. But when you're applying for a graduate study, you're more, more, almost on your own. Um, and, you, and you, you know, you have maybe some of your uh, close uh, professors that, you know, or your lecturers that you have a good relationship with that, that may help you. But uh, start start thinking through that, you know, what is your truth? What is what is that hook for your personal statement? Write your truth. And, and I would say even make it personal. Um, and it shouldn't it doesn't have to be so, uh, you know, academic. What are the personal reasons for why you want to apply for a master's? What it, what what is it that you know? What what is your profound reason? Um, and and write a draft and get someone to uh, proofread it. Get some comments. Get some feedback. Um, and use your network. It could be family or friends. Could be that lecturer. That, you could know, be some... you. Yes, yes, it could be me. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> yes, I would be very happy to help. And uh, you know, I think get get someone to read it. Get some feedback because it's it's good to get that criticism beforehand. Uh, rather than not not getting accepted, not getting offers later. So I think, you know, r revise that draft um, and and really and make it make it your own, make it your truth, and 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 start early with the personal statement, the statement of purpose. A great advice, great answer. I I also like to say sometimes the statement of purpose or the MBA goals essay is mm. a should show how that graduate program is going to the, be the bridge between where you are today and where you want to go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yes, 
and the, I completely agree about the hook or the lead, whatever you want to call it, that grabs mm -hmm. the reader's attention. But that would explain what you want to do in the future, why this mm -hmm. program is the right one for you, because it's going mm -hmm. to be that bridge, how it's going to support your goals and lead yes. you down that path. But the, the idea mm -hmm. of starting with hook, I think, is a great one. Yes. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. What's critical? Many applications, certainly U.S. applications, ask for either a resume and or a job history. Mm -hmm. And how, how, what's your recommendations for that? Um, so I think, again, your resume uh, for graduate study, it should, uh, it, it's almost like your resume is for, it's for a job, but, you know, it's, it's, uh, you are, you, you are in that you would be putting your work experience uh, and uh, showing your uh, skills, your work experience. And your resume really has to be geared towards the program that you're applying for. Um, so tailoring that to each application um, and, again, not making it generic. Uh, so your education, uh, your educational qualifications um, and your work experience, the skills that you've developed, um, any publications you may have. Uh, so it's it's almost like, yes, it's like a professional resume or a CV, but it comes to graduate applications. Um, yeah, so I, I, I think, again, for the, uh, the U.S. schools, I find prefer a shorter resume, maybe one page or maximum two, whereas the U.K. sometimes, uh, you know, CV. You can, yeah, uh, yes, a uh, CV can be, uh, you can be two or three pages, but I would re certainly recommend it should be short and concise, maximum two pages. I, I wouldn't recommend going more than that. But for the U.S., I would say one page would be would be concise and crisp and very focused on your uh, your work experience if you if you have any you know if, you, if you've if you've taken a few years after your undergraduate and accumulated work experience so if you haven't then um any internships you've done um any activities extracurriculars that Leadership. that demonstrate yeah that demonstrate and, and 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 it should again the work experience that you list in that cv or resume it think about the bullet points think about what each experience is, how is that demonstrating that this is relevant to the program that you're applying for? So it, it would mean uh, changing and tailoring perhaps each CV for each university application because uh, the programs may vary. So in the social sciences, you might be applying for different strands of the social sciences and, and, and different universities. Um, so thinking about the very detail in each experience as well. And the more you can demonstrate how that um, how you're a better fit for that program would help. Wonderful. Great. Thank you. How about recommenders? How should applicants choose recommenders and should they prep them at all? You know, um, I, again, I think starting to think early, um, like who, who they have a good uh, professional relationship with also, uh, you know, but I, I, I think uh, again, two or three recommend recommenders uh, are, are the requirement. So if you have a recommender who's, uh, re related to the subject you're applying for, that's that's absolutely perfect. Even if it's not somebody who who knows your work, who knows your academic work, and can uh, give you a reference about that at all. It could, if you've done internships, that could also be a reference. But I would say, if it's two references and two recommenders, keep them academic from your undergraduate lecturers and you know your academics that you've been who've been teaching you, who you've uh, who who you have a good relationship with, and. I, I don't think there's much we can do in terms of prepping them, but yes, giving them as much information as possible about I mean, the course you're applying for, giving them time, um, not just <laughs> expecting them to um, write your reference within a week, but, you know, letting them know. And, and that, again, I think links back to your own planning and your own timeline. So if you uh, start thinking about it a year ahead, I would say it's, it, it is like applying for a job. Um, and then thinking about identifying the recommenders, letting them know well in advance. I mean, a few, a few months or a couple of months at least. Or, you know, I think so giving them enough time about the course you're applying for, um, your motivations for applying and how that would lead to your future career. Do you want to do a PhD afterwards or do you want to... You know, or do you want to go and start working in an investment bank, et cetera, or, you know, for or example, whatever the field is? Yeah, yeah consulting, yes, yeah. Or whatever it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, you've been doing this a long time, many years of experience. Mm -hmm. What are the more common mistakes that you've seen applicants make? I think sometimes when and, and a common mistake is <laughs> in, in a personal statement or a statement of purpose, you get so spelling mistakes or grammatical errors. 
which yeah. which 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 shows that they haven't proofread it um and you know and you've and they, they've spent so much time preparing that application but but haven't done those very basic things and it could be linked to other other mistakes which is that maybe they're applying on the day itself so <laughs> i would say don't apply on the on the day of the deadline like apply a, a day or a couple of days because often what happens is then they miss some uh, some key requirements they may not be able to fulfill the recommenders for example or you know again like uh, that just uh, that doesn't give a good impression if you're if you have spelling mistakes and grammatical errors uh, another common mistake is that uh, person statements are very generic so they're not uh, they're not geared or tailored towards the school that they've applied for um and and i think uh, you know as, as someone who's reading your application we we would like to know why that university? What is it about that university? Is it, you know, have you have you looked at who 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 are the uh, academics, who are the people in that department that you're applying to? Uh, what are their research? Uh, what is it about that department? Is it is it the research methods? Uh, you know, or you know, so because I know some departments have a very quantitative approach, some have a very qualitative approach um, in terms of their research methods. So have you thought about that? So showing as much as you can in in that person statement that shows that you've actually done your research. So I think generic <laughs> personal statements are another common mistake, I would say. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, I think these are these are probably the, the most common mistakes. I agree. Those are mm -hmm. certainly good ones. Now, you've again, you've been doing this for a long time. You've done it in the UK. You've done it in mm -hmm. Pakistan. And now you're doing it in the United States. What do you like about advising applicants specifically to graduate programs? So I, I really enjoy the process of just working with students. Um, I mean, I, going through my own journey of education, I, I went straight from a bachelor's to a master's to a PhD. I didn't I didn't have a break, but I, you know, I, I learned it my own. I learned it by myself. Um, I didn't have the advice when I was doing it. I didn't have uh, I didn't have all of these uh, resources, I think, to I, I had to kind of learn the hard way where right? I made my choices and then learned and, and I I think I just want to pass on my knowledge to students and I want to advise them the best that I can so that they make informed choices, um, that they don't, they're not making, you know, unnecessary mistakes or uh, they're not confused. So I, I just really enjoy that process of passing on the knowledge to students um, here in Pakistan, the US, the UK. Yeah, there's something quite meaningful about this work, uh, which, you know, which is more than just the commercial side of it. it it's more that you're making an impact on someone's life you're making i mean and you know and i say this to my students what you study today for your bachelor's your master's or it doesn't necessarily determine your future or your career no. it's quite dynamic it can change oh, and, yeah. and that's and that's okay and i did i did uh, economics and econometrics then i did ir and then i did sociology so all three different <laughs> subjects right all the social sciences now you're doing admissions <laughs> yes yes yeah. absolutely and i find this very rewarding and i think i just enjoy interacting it's a two-way process i'm learning from them also um and you know the world is changing and people and what they want to study and and how they uh, how they're and, and now with this and we spoke about this you know about chat gbt and now yeah. how people are using that and and <laughs> you know how do you how do you keep yourself original in a world of artificial intelligence and um how do you keep your mind uh, active and thinking in its own way so i think um yeah it's 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 a uh, it's a very rewarding field and I, I just really love uh, working with with students and yeah the one-on-one -on -one is, is delightful and, mm -hmm. and of course mm -hmm. when you get to the point when somebody calls you up or emails you and says I'm in I got yes. into my top yes. choice <laughs> yeah it's wonderfully it rewarding yes so, yes um, no mm -hmm. I, I'm with you on that mm -hmm. what do you wish I would have asked you uh, you've asked me uh, wonderful great questions and very important questions um, I think we've covered uh, the most of the important uh, aspects, I think, perhaps maybe, you know, what were the what what can be challenges or struggles for, uh, uh, for women, or, uh, okay. for, you know, or uh, I think that that could women, perhaps not, yeah, for women, maybe in my culture specifically, and I don't know how it is in different cultures, but I, I come from Pakistani culture. And so the, the challenges I faced, 
you know, could be unique just to my culture. But, you know, it was, why do you want to do a PhD? You know, was your family you, supportive? Why? I think they were supportive up to a point. <laughs> and then when I wanted to, when I, when I, when I wanted to do my PhD, it, uh, it, it was very challenging because uh, uh, I was, uh, yes, I, 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 my family did not support me when I wanted to do my PhD because they thought I should get married. Um, and, you know, there were, uh, there was lots of pressure on me to not to do, but I, I had been, but I got accepted into Oxford and that was my dream, you know, and it's a story that I often share with my students. I applied to Oxford three times and I got accepted the third time. I didn't, ex I, I, I applied for the PPE first. I didn't get accepted. Then I applied for a master's. I didn't get accepted. Then I applied for the PhD and I did. So for me, it was a, a huge achievement that I've finally now going to Oxford, my dream, but, but there was also that conflict of, uh, you know, uh, get married, and 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 I and I had to do it on my own. I had to I had to face a lot of obstacles. I had to, yeah, I had to. Tr I went to Oxford alone on the day, on the very first day. Um, yeah. So it, it was very difficult, um, you know, doing achieving my dream. But I think that's that's what makes it worth it. Like they say, like the famous quote, "No one said it would be easy, but just that it would be worth it." Um, so I think some of the challenges, we really have to be open about them. And for me and a woman in my culture, it's not, uh, it's not very common that they study so much. Uh, that sure. they, yeah, so so, I think, so how did you um, overcome the challenge? Were you just very determined? Did you have some friends that you turned to or mm -hmm. were you just your own internal strength? I, I think mostly it was my own internal strength because I, Oxford was too important for me to give up. Um, okay. So I went there and I went. And I went to Oxford without funding. That's another challenge because I had a fully funded PhD offer from Bristol, um, mm -hmm. another university in the UK. But I, I gave that up because I, I wanted to go to Oxford. So I had to be quite creative. And I had to every year I had to think, where will I get funding from? Uh, would I, I'd be applying to my college for a bursary or my department for a scholarship. I applied for a few bank loans. I did a lot of jobs alongside. I did teaching, uh, which which went which worked out really well because then in the after my PhD I got a lectureship in that same year because of the teaching I had done but I had done that for financial reasons so I, I, it was you know there, it was a very difficult time but also I think uh, because it was my because I was so passionate about it it was the internal strength which just made me and and eventually I think you know um, you know your family does come around to it but I think yes I made very good friends. Um, and, and, um, and Oxford is just such a magical place. You, you, you get lost. It looks in that. magical in the background. <laughs> yes. The yes. Um, so, so yes, I think some of these challenges, you know, people have different challenges. A lot yes. of students, a lot of my students who are applying have funding challenges, financial difficulty. Yeah. Various, various challenges, but I think, uh, being open about them and thinking through them and seeing how you're going to, especially if you're doing a PhD, because it's a long four or five years <laughs> yes for and, sure uh, so that can be uh, quite quite a, a task mm -hmm. well thank you very much for sharing that story I think it's inspiring and I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that yeah I'm glad you asked that question so um Sundas this has been wonderful pleasure talking to you getting to know you a little bit more and and yeah. hearing how how you can help applicants through their graduate school application mm -hmm. journey I really enjoyed speaking to you so thank you again Listener, thank you too for tuning in. You can learn more about Dr. Sundas Ali on her bio page at Accepted. I'll link to it from the show notes and the contact her. You can also contact her from her bio page. And you can find all that at accepted.com slash 574. Links to her bio page and her contact me page. And of course, if you'd like her to advise you individually, she is currently available to guide you as an accepted consultant. If you found this show worthwhile, I have a favor to ask. Tell your friends about it. They'll thank you, and so do I. A friend just told me about a podcast that I started listening to, and I love it. So again, tell your friends. A quick reminder, Master the Paradox at the Heart of Graduate Admissions by downloading our free guide, Fitting In and Standing Out, The Paradox at the Heart of Admissions. You can grab your free copy at accepted.com slash F-I-S-O. This is Admission Straight Talk produced by Accepted, and I'm your host, Linda Abraham. I'll talk to you again next week.